Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 15th, 2018, and this is the week in charts. Somebody says they're going for beers. You're going for beers already? Dang. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for taking time to busy schedule. Uh, thanks for uh, coming in a little late this week, a little later than normal. I'm uh, Based on what's going on in life with me, I'm kind of thinking about doing shows at different times, and I've been thinking about this for a long time, even before I got... Things got a little crazy, just so different people in different time zones and people with and without jobs can uh, attend. So if you're watching a recording of this and you have um, an idea what would be a good time, let me know. And I'll see if I can work around you. I think by accident, we ended up on Thursdays. Those of you who have been around for a long time know that I used to do a show with uh, Warden Brothers on Thursdays. And I think it just became the standing time for the show when they stopped doing the little chart shows. Anyway, uh, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and we'll have a lot to say about that towards the end of the presentation. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides until we get to the end of the slides. And then you can ask about whatever you want, uh, because I, I do tend to go off on a tangent quite a bit, and that'll just throw me off a little. Uh, when we get to the charts, or hold off on your stock picks, I should say, when we get to the charts, when we get to the charts, we should have plenty of time today, by the way, to get to the charts and uh, get to all your stock picks. Uh, just ask about one stock at a time, that's for your benefit, and hit return, and that way I know whether I covered your stocks or not. So this week's focus is why aren't there more consistent and profitable traders, and that'll make more sense in just a minute. I also want to do a bear market update, and we talked about Dave Light in our last show, which is a pretty cool concept, a pretty simple concept, and I also want to talk about where we are, possible bear market update, and some things to think about, and one thing I woke up thinking about this morning is last, well, when, when was the last show? I forget. I think it was last week. We talked about how sometimes tops are a process, sometimes they're an event, but believe it or not, more often than not, tops are actually a process, and everybody thinks they're an event. And as we talked about in prior shows, you can even go back to look at uh, a year like 1987, right before the crash, where the market topped out for a long, long, long time. That's the only thing that's got me concerned. Not the only thing, but one of the things that has me concerned. That'll make more sense when we get to the charts. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often point out, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. If you do get a chance, read the disclaimer on my website. Lots of interesting facts in there, such as if you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast, and quite a few other things. I've often thought about putting a bunch of those type of things inside the disclaimer, just kind of bury them in there just to see if anybody ever reads them. But that would take some idle time on my part, something I haven't had much of lately. All right, so what's the genesis of this presentation? Well, a couple of years back on Facebook, and by the way, what the hell happened to Facebook? I remember when I first got on Facebook, people were posting vacation pictures, traveling around the world, and making you feel pretty bad about having to work while they're off having fun. And then they also used to post a lot of pictures of cute little kittens. And somewhere in between, it became really political and saved the world and all these horrible things. Anyway, before I digress too far, which I've been known to do, I got a little pop-up from somebody in Brazil, and they were working on a piece on why there aren't more consistent and profitable traders. And he wanted my take on that. And that sort of got me thinking about it. And that's where the column on my website came from, which originally was written two years ago. I just freshened it up. And then I got to thinking maybe it'd be worthwhile talking about that, these things in today's presentation. So that's where this is all coming from. Now, as I got into the column that I've done before, and ironically, I had put this dead horse beating thing in it, I have a bad habit of beating the dead horse. It drives my wife nuts. Don't worry. Here comes an old joke. I am not stupid enough to make the short trip joke. But 
I do tend to beat the dead horse in my personal life. And I asked my wife, Marcy, a while back if she would take a look at a column I wrote and give me her two cents, let me know what she thought. What's the old saying when somebody's asking for an opinion? More often than not, they're looking for an accomplice. And I was basically Andying her. My brother, brother-in-law's name is Andy. And when he asks for your opinion, he's already formulated what your response should be. And we in the family call that Andying. But uh, I was Andying my wife, expecting her to say, oh, Dave, it's a great column. You're so awesome. And uh, instead she said, you say a lot of the same shit over and over. I'm like, yeah. And initially I was a little taken back. But then I got to think about it. It's like, nope, I'm going to keep saying the same stuff over and over until you people get it. Not you people here, but you people meaning the hundreds of people who email me asking questions about trading who don't listen and they continue to make the same mistakes. And that's a whole other presentation in and of itself. You know what you're doing wrong, but you do it anyway. And I've covered that ad nauseum. Now, one thing they do is they confuse the issue with facts. Yeah, that was Australia. Uh, I think we were on a ferry and the, um, the bridge. I forget the name of it. I wanted to climb it. My wife was scared. And uh, now I regret that. You know, the great. Now i got to put that on my bucket list. I'll probably never get down there for, or at least won't get down there for a while until I get invited back, I suppose. But, yeah, that's the Opera House. Um, so why aren't there more successful traders? Well, one of the biggest problems that I see is that they confuse the issue with facts. They think they're – has to be some sort of logic involved in the markets. Just last weekend, I was at a cocktail party, and somebody was explaining to me why this stock was going higher and, and saying they're doing this or doing that, and, and I, try to, I try to just shake my head and have my drink, and I was like, eh, well, maybe that might work, but maybe it won't. Markets are often illogical. And often irrational, too. And Tom McClellan's mom, the late Mary McClellan, once said, and this has become a very popular quote. I've seen this on the Internet quite often. Tom gave this to me personally after I quoted Tom on something. And he said, I'll do you one better. My late mother, Mary, used to say people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And others use far more sophisticated methods. So markets are logical. And as I'm putting together this presentation a few minutes ago, I was thinking that, you know, my 18-year-old daughter, she just became 18, my youngest, is getting ready to head off to college. And I will have to sell some things, more than likely, depending on where I am at the time, but there's a better than average chance that I might have to sell some things to pay for her college. Now, what does that have to do with the underlying market? What that, does that have to do with the underlying stocks or funds? Absolutely nothing. So people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. And you have to remember that the market is made up with a lot of emotional beings. That's what the market is. As I said in Trading Full Circle, and I hope I get the quote right, but Yogi Berra said, once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. Well, if markets were perfect, they would not exist. The only reason a market exists is because there's a disequilibrium and I guess you would call it opinions between people. If everybody agreed on price, there would be no market. So the market is made up of a bunch of emotional beings, which, by the way, one of which is you. And another reoccurring kind of beat the dead horse theme with me. My brother-in-law makes fun of me because I say harsh. <laughs> beat the dead horse. Another one of those reoccurring beat the dead horse themes with me is that you can't, from a physiological standpoint, make a decision without emotions. So some people say, oh, well, you have to remove the emotions from your trader trading. Well, you can't do that. 
you would not be a normal functioning human being. And this is based on the work of Denise Scholl, Damasio, which I think she got her work from Damasio, and many, many others. But that's just a fact. Each decision in your life has to have an emotion, and with that emotion also comes a consequence. And the example that Denise Shaw gave in a presentation when I was in San Fran several years back, speaking at a conference over there, the, the example she gave was that people who had the unfortunate, either through illness or accident, were unfortunate to have a part of their brain damaged down around your amygdala, that little primal part of your brain damaged, that if that becomes damaged, they can no longer make a decision because there's no emotions attached to that decision. So the doctor will say, okay, we're through with our meeting for today. Would you like to meet next Tuesday or next Wednesday? Well, they go through over and over the reasons they should meet on Tuesday, the reason they should meet on Wednesday. But unfortunately, they reach a stalemate. They, can, they can't make a decision because Tuesday or Wednesday, neither one has more of a consequence or an emotion attached to it than the other. So we're emotional beings. We just have to embrace that. In one way, and I know I'm digressing a little bit here, going, getting into that uh, primal brain, that lizard brain, so-called lizard brain, amygdala, limbic system, all that good stuff way down in your brain. And that's a very small part of your brain. It's it's very small for, for a reason, I think. I'm not a neurologist, although I do have the Neurologist for Dummies book here. I haven't read it yet, but Maybe someday I'll get around to reading it and 100 other books I intend to read. But the way I wrap my head around is that the reason it's small is so it can be quick acting. And as I've said quite a bit, you have to, sometimes you end up with these flight or fight situations. You get ready to step out of the curb in New York City and there's one of those yellow cabs coming at you. You don't say, oh, well, hey, look, I'm going to get hit by a cab or is he going fast enough to hit me or Oh, uh, this, is he mad at me? Or what's wrong with him? And you can't contemplate your navel. You have to get out the way. Well, that little part of your brain gives you that emotional reaction, that adrenaline rush, dumps the cortisol. Your kidneys dump the cortisol into your system, get you all emotionally charged, and you jump out the way. And you need that to survive in life. That's important. Unfortunately, that type of reaction in the market can often get you into a lot of trouble. So the markets are emotional, and so are you. Do not expect them to behave rationally. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not reoccurring patterns. In fact, we actually use the psychology of the market to our favor. For instance, let's say we're trading a trend knockout. Well, what we're doing with that, I knew I'd be drawn before the end of this presentation. What we're doing that with that is we're looking for a market that's in a trend. So obviously there's some sort of what? Demand. Okay. But then we're looking for a sharp sell-off, a TKO, trend knockout. So this knocks out some of these people. Everybody was happy up until here, right? Well, all of a sudden it knocks out some people. Okay. And a couple things happen. The Johnny Come Lately is their first to bail out. So it gets the Johnny Come Lately's out. So these people tend to dump their positions and take you out with them. So we get rid of some of those Johnny Come Latelys. We attract some eager shorts, which, of course, if the market does turn around and go back up, once we trigger in, they're going to be a hurt and pup, and they're going to force to buy at higher levels. Now, they're going to – they have big egos, so they might wait until they're way up here and buy, and then you get a parabolic move higher. Now, the purpose of this lesson is not to teach you the trading, the trend knockout pattern. If you go to my go, go to members login on my website and create a log on, and then you can get to the TKO and some other patterns that I have there. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we could use this emotional part of the market or the way the market behaves emotionally to our advantage. Provide, of course, we're willing to embrace, not try to eliminate our own emotions because we're not, we're not like Spock here, right? So being cognizant of your own feelings in trading and in life in general will help you to wrap your head around the emotional nature of the market. 
One thing I like to do is I like to be cognizant of the amount of F-bombs that I'm dropping. If I'm coming in and yelling F, I know I'm doing something wrong. Years ago, I often op open up many speeches like this. But years ago, to make a long story short, I know, not easy for me, but to make a long story short, years ago, somebody asked me what I did for, a nice little young lady, asked me what I did for a living. And before I could answer, a buddy of mine blurted out, he sits in front of a couple screens and yells F all day long. <laughs> and it's true, that's what I used to do. And I still drop more F-bombs than I should. But wrapping your head around your own emotion, or wrapping your head, or being cognizant, I should say, about your own emotions helps you to wrap your head around the emotional nature of the entire market. Now, another reason why they aren't more consistent and successful traders is that they try to control the situation. A large part of your life, of your success in life, being able to function as a normal human being, comes from your ability to control the situation. Well, in trading, you have no control over the situation. You can only control yourself. And as we get to the back of this presentation or the end of this presentation, I'll, I'm going to talk about a couple of things you can do there. Uh, one, before we go too much further in, but one of the things you can do is, as I often say, you can embrace your amygdala, that little fast acting, acting part of your brain, and when you go to make that emotionally charged decision that is outside of your plan, believe it or not, one of the things you could do is simply breathe. And it only takes a few seconds to get around that amygdala to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. And that's why I wanted to talk about how it's fast acting a little while ago to set the stage for that. But just simply breathing and saying, OK, am I why am I ditching my plan? It's kind of interesting. I'm reading Annie Duke's Thinking in Bets, which I'm going to talk about towards the end of this presentation a little bit. But the part I was reading this morning, she talked about the, the swear jar. Of, uh, like I said earlier, we're dropping the F-bomb. So maybe get you a little swear jar in your office. But she also talked about the, and what did she call it? Oh, I should run and get the book. <laughs> I forget what, exactly what she called it, but it would be along the lines of you not following your plan and, and not following the process to document that carefully and I'll uh, I guess in the when I do a book review on this or talk about the book some more I'll get the I'll get the book out and, and talk about how she talked about it but it's kind of like along the lines of the swear jar you're cognizant when you're not following your plan now being right versus making money is a big one and the reason that is, in life, failure is not an option. As I often say, if you're an engineer and half your bridges fall down, well, guess what? Maybe just one bridge falls down. You're probably not going to be an engineer for long. But if you're a doctor, a surgeon specifically, and you're killing off half your patients, you're not going to be a doctor for very long. So we tend to focus on being right in life because there is a huge consequence in not being right in life. But in the markets, you're going to be wrong, and you're going to be wrong a lot. As I often say in longer-term trend following, you're only going to be right about 70, I'm sorry, you're only going to be right about 28% of the time. And I did years and years and years of testing way back in the day, maybe 20 years ago, and that's the number that I – came to over 20 years ago. Good Lord, I'm getting old. And that seems to be confirmed in, in everything that I've seen. Now, the only way to make money in a market is to capture a trend. So if you're in longer-term trend-following mode, you're going to be wrong, let's just say, 70% of the time, or 
round it up. Three quarters of percent of the time, you're going to be wrong. So the way I try to improve upon that is through a hybrid system by trading for a swing trade. And then if things work out, keeping a piece of the pie for a longer term trade or something that hopefully turns into a longer term trade. I'm making that transition into a longer term trader without having to go in with excessive risk to begin with. And by taking profits, and even if it gets stopped out after I take profits, at least I've improved the odds a little bit. And I'm kind of jumping over these psychological hurdles by climbing up that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, getting that, that instant gratification need that we have this craving for, especially now with cell phones and microwaves and all of these instant delivery movies and everything else. We want everything and we want it now. So society has trained us not to be willing to, to wait. So I think I've solved for that to the best I can by trading for both short-term gains and longer-term gains. And that's a reoccurring theme that I talk about quite often. And I have some uh, cornerstone comments uh, or commentary, I should say, on my website that covers the money management and these other things. Or you can just get trading full circle and you have it all. Anyway, you can't be wrong much in real life. Depending on your career, you will be wrong, obviously, but you can't be wrong much, or you get a lot of you get in a lot of trouble. Another reason is, and I don't know if uh, I think it's behind this slide, this picture. Let me just read it to you. In life, you must take action to be successful. In trading, you must do nothing unless there is something to do. It's kind of like the old Jimmy Rodgers, Roddy, ugh, Jimmy Rogers adage I talk about over and over from Market Wizards. I just wait until there's money lying in the corner. Then all I have to do is walk over and pick it up. In the meantime, I do Nothing. Well, like I said in the column that this presentation came from, unless you're a toll taker, you're not going to get paid to sit on your ass. You have to take some action. But what happens as a trader is from being wrong, not wanting to be wrong, we tend to micromanage. And if you look at the current column that I have up now where I talked about the work of Robert Frey, once you get into a trade, even if it's a profitable trade, and I've done this presentation quite a bit where I show how many days are unprofitable. I had an hourly trade a while back in the euro versus dollar a few weeks ago, and it was unprofitable for 90% of the trade. And finally, the last 10%, I finally got the move out of it. I finally got my swing trade profit, and I finally got my trailing stop lower to cash out it and actually make money in the trade. But it was pretty hard putting on a trade and then watching it lose day after day after day. And this was on an hourly chart. So that would be like holding a day trade, of, uh, I'm sorry, holding a, a, a normal daily chart trade for weeks or even months, for months. So you're going to be wrong a lot and you're going to have a craving to take some action because you feel like you have to do something. And I see it happen all the time. People put a plan together. And that's sort of like I talked about in that Pi article on my website. If you're watching this in the future, then uh, that would be the article I put out on 314.18. And I called it Trading as Easy as Pi. And that was an updated article that I did from a few years back. I'm going through all my old content one by one very slowly. And I'm taking the stuff and I'm cleaning it up and adding to it and spending upon it and I've come to realize that quality is much better than quantity. I've got some really good stuff back there, but I need to clean it up. So I've been working pretty hard to make that happen. Anyway, as humans, especially as successful humans, by the way, one of the biggest problems with trading that I see is that it attracts the smartest and brightest mind. I'm not sure why I'm interested in it, but it does attract the smartest and brightest minds out there. And these smart people and bright people are motivated. So they're used to taking action. 
okay? They're used to being right. And in the trading world, these things don't necessarily work. Micromanagement is probably the biggest sin that I see. And I see people relate it back to some sort of logic. For instance, hey, Dave, and this was one, there's, there's so many examples, but one in particular, we were short a stock. This was maybe 10 years ago, but we were short a stock. And the overall market tanked. And this stock actually had a decent rally. And someone told me, Dave, I just bailed out because the market tanked and this stock went up. That should not have happened. That does not make sense. So I went ahead and got out. Well, the stop wasn't hit. If you were following your plan, you should have stayed in. And like Mr. Frey says, you're going to be wrong the majority of the time. Not only are you wrong often, more often, not only are you wrong more often than you're right, and it could still be profitable, but many times, even when you're right, you're wrong for a while, okay, once you're in the trade. Anyway, long story endless, I know too late. The person told me they bailed out because the stock went up, market went down. This was a short. We wanted to go down. So something's wrong, right? Logically, it doesn't make sense. Well, the next day, the stock had a 50% haircut. And after I was trading, they announced that their drugs were killing people or bad earnings or whatever the case may be. And the stock had a 50% haircut. But I see it all the time. I remember even further back, we got in a stock and we were long and it just chopped sideways for about a month after we got in it. But it never did hit the stop. And then the stock got bought out. And I know, based on my emails, a lot of people bailed out because they became impatient and they felt like they had to take action. Oh, there's what I was looking for. In life, you must take action to be successful. But in trading, you must do nothing unless there's something to do. There it is. I knew I had it somewhere. The other thing that keeps there from being – keeps it – keeps there from being more successful, consistent, and profitable traders is their end goal oriented. And being end goal oriented is great for life. Okay, uh, you want to lose weight, you have to have a goal in mind, you have to work towards that goal, you have to chip away at it. Anything you can pretty much think about in life you have to be in goal oriented. Well, in trading, you have to be process oriented. You have to follow the process. Provided you have a conceptually correct and viable methodology, then you simply follow the process. I know, easier said than done, but don't micromanage. Let the stop take you out. All these things I preach about, beat the dead horse on over and over. But what happens when people start losing money trading and their methodology still works, there's nothing wrong with it, instead of continuing to follow the methodology, what do they do? Well, they go grail hunting. <laughs> what are you going to talk about today? The whole, not the holy grail. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but they go grail hunting, and I see this happen over and over and over again. And every now and then they'll hit upon something just at the right time. And as I often preach, by the way, everything works better with trends. So if the market's trending and going higher and you're buying stocks, and guess what? It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're going to make money, okay? Don't confuse brains with the bull market, as I talked about in a recent column. And along the lines of, getting back to being right, there's a lot of things out there that you can do and be very, very right. You can you could sell options and you're probably going to be right about 90% of the time. Okay. Well, as I often say, that'll work until it don't. Okay. It'll work until you blow up. You could trade reversion to the mean, meaning that the market sells off, drops like a stone, 
and you decide to buy it, well, that'll actually work, believe it or not. But once again, it'll work until it don't. So if you got a market, let's say it drops like a stone, gets super duper overbought, well, you could buy it on the way down and play that little bounce up, okay? Unfortunately, as I just said, it'll work until it don't, until this oversold becomes super duper duper oversold. There were some famous people back in 2008 that sold options at the bottom. They sold a bunch of put options. And these were value players, people that should not be trading options, okay? These, there's a lot of value players out there that's like, oh, gee, shucks, we just buy good stocks. We buy value. But what they're secretly doing is a lot of derivative trading, which is not buying value, okay? But there were some people in 2008 that was later found out that sold a whole bunch of options while the market was down 50%. Well, the market came back after being down 50%. But what if that market continued to crash? They had over leveraged positions that could have wiped out the fund. So I don't want to jump ahead too far, but that that end goal outcome bias orientation, like, oh, well, it worked. Well, yeah, it worked, but it'll work until it don't. By the way, I get more pure reversion to the mean traders as new clients that have experience than as opposed to uh, people coming in new to trading. I get a lot of new to trading people because I keep things simple. But people who go off to chase the rainbows, especially those who spend a lot of time doing a reversion to the mean trade, and they come back to me about 10 years later and say, all right, Dave, I did my grail hunt. I got caught in that rabbit hole of reversion to the mean trading. And yeah, you're right, it does end badly. Now I'm ready to come back to just plain old trend following in a simplified way. Now, another problem that I see quite often is that they're bargain hunters, okay? So if I recommend a stock, and this is again a reoccurring theme, and yes, I do beat the dead horse. But I'm a pullback player. And as a general statement. So I'm looking to catch it, capture that reversion to the mean move in the direction of the trend. So my entry might be up here for a pullback that looks like this. And then as I've said quite often, I'll get an email about six months Let's say I recommend the stock today, six months from now. Let's say the stock never triggers, okay, and does this. Six months from now, somebody will email me and say, hey, Dave, what to do with X, Y, Z? X, Y, Z, I never recommended that. Yes, you did. We go back and forth a few times, look at the records. Oh, I sure did. Well, it never triggered. Well, they bought it somewhere in here because they thought it was cheap. If I'm saying get in at 10 and it's down here at 7, well, that's cheap, right? They saved 30% or more. But unfortunately, it's no longer set up, and it just keeps imploding. But I see it happen quite often. People get in even though they don't get triggered in. Now, waiting for a trigger, believe it or not, meaning waiting for the market to rally up and hit your trigger, will keep you out of a lot of trouble. There's a lot of stocks that I recommend and a lot of stocks that I try to trade personally, combination thereof, that never, ever trigger. And by simply waiting for an entry, you keep yourself out of trouble. And sometimes I'll put in a stop market order. I'll put an actual hard stop like right here to buy it, to trigger me in. And it'll never trigger, but I kind of see that as like, well, I'm, this is kind of like actually being in the position with zero risk. Now, this works pretty good in Forex because the markets are open 24 hours. It doesn't work as good in stocks because technically a stock could gap open the next day. And I don't carry orders overnight. But in a, in a market that stays open 24-7, such as crypto Forex, you could actually put in that hard stop and go to sleep and forget about it. But intraday, obviously, you could certainly do this. Each day, come in and put in that new order. If you get triggered, fine. If you don't, so what? You may have missed a losing trade. So bargain hunting is a big, big, big problem. 
Speaking of bargains, I have two specials this week because I repurposed an article that talked about trading IPOs, and IPOs are still doing fairly well. Sometimes when the market becomes iffy, these speculative stocks, such as IPOs, can do quite well. And then I also did another article, which a lot of which we're talking about today came from. And it sort of makes a big reference back to trading full circle. So I went ahead and put that one on sale too. And the promo code for that is TFC50, all lowercase. And if you just go to DaveLander.com slash TFC, TFC50. 100% money back guarantee on the courses for your first 30 days and lifetime support on those. Also, the trade IPOs is not in the learning management system yet, but it will be. And any course that you buy, lifetime support, so you'll have access to it once it's in the learning management system. The learning management system, I, did, I do the green screens, and it's a little bit more polished. Same information, but a little bit more polished and fleshed out a little more, and then in a format where you have to complete it in order and take quizzes and pass those quizzes and move on to the next level. And that's been a godsend for me because people will buy a book or a course and then ask me a thousand questions, and I think this person must be mentally challenged. And before I call them a name, um, I was like, well, let's figure out what's wrong with them. I'm like, uh, did you... Did you notice in this certain part of the course? Yeah, I've been meaning to watch that. It's like, okay, well, now I know whether you watched it or not. And we can work from there. Anyway, as I said quite often, in life, experience is the best teacher. Unfortunately, the market could often be a bad teacher. And the story there, as I told ad nauseum, is when we were kids and we'd go to the beach between the sand, the surf, and the sun, and the styrofoam, we would lay on these styrofoam little cheap surfboards. We'd go buy them from the local grocery store. They'd last about three or four hours. But that was enough to pretty much chafe you really bad. And the part of your body sticks out the most, your belly and your nipples, would get really, 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 really chafe. And I was with a buddy of mine about five years later, and we were out water skiing, and I got in the boat after my run, and we start putt-putting. I, I turn the wheel and start putt-putting over to these little kids playing on a huge block of styrofoam that broke off from the oil field, probably a pipeline or something, I'm guessing. And they were climbing on it, rubbing on it, jumping off of it. They were having a blast. And my buddy's like, what are you doing? He was a few years older than me. I said, well, you know, I'm talking about chafed nipples and stuff. I said, I'm going to go tell those kids. I'm going to save them a lot of grief. And he reaches over calmly and turns the wheel away. I'm like, he's like, what are you doing? I said, he says, you know what, Dave? In life, experience is the best teacher. Now, you will need some experience when it comes to the markets. Unfortunately, the market can often be, and this is something I, I'm sick of myself. I'm sick of hearing it myself, from myself. But the market can often be a bad teacher. Without going into a lot of details, you know, often asked in a presentation, how many people have been stopped out to the penny and then watch in anguish as the market takes off without them? And usually a third of the class will raise their hands. Okay, I raise my hand too. Stopped out and then market takes off without you. Well, that teaches you not to use stops. I was that the aforementioned gentleman I was talking about earlier. He was telling me about something and I said, well, as long as you have a stop in mind. And he says, no, 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 no. I don't use stops because they're out to get me. I've chewed my broker out on more than one occasion. Now I'm smart. I don't use stops. I was like, well, okay. That'll work until it don't. You know, a little voice inside of my head, Dave, you're here to have fun. <laughs> don't, don't argue. Anyway, but the market does teach you to, to do this. The market teaches you to micromanage. Micromanagement will work until it don't, okay, like, like a lot of things in the market, and that's the hard part. And this all brings us to the outcome bias, being in goal-oriented, outcome biases, etc. So not honoring your stop because the market comes back quite a bit. Well, guess what? We've been, more often than not, it comes back. 
we've been in a bull market for a long time. Okay. Uh, recently, the market was beginning to tank. It looked really ugly. So I allowed my my uh, stocks to get stopped out. Well, it turned around and went back up, at least for a while. We'll take a look at that in a minute. So did I do the wrong thing because I lost money or gave up open profits? Absolutely not. Okay. But if you're in goal oriented and have an outcome bias, then you would think that's the thing to do. Terrence O'Dean says markets generate a lot of data, but they don't generate a lot of clear feedback. And this is kind of a reoccurring theme in Annie Duke's book. Uh, it could easily be a behavioral science book or a little bit of a trading book, I would say, or certainly a trading psychology book. Outcomes are noisy. Good decisions may have bad outcomes. Bad decisions may have good outcomes. We all have a tendency to take credit for our successes while blaming our failures and bad luck or others. And that's Annie Duke's reoccurring theme. And what's the um, Paul Helmuth once said, if it wasn't for luck, I'd win every hand. Well, that's a very, very arrogant thing to say. And his point is that he plays his per poker perfectly. Well, maybe he does. He probably plays more perfectly than, than most mortal men. But nobody's perfect. And what Helmets is saying that the luck allows people to win when they shouldn't because they get lucky. And that's a bad philosophy on life. So sometimes you can do everything right and be process oriented in the markets and follow your plan. And it simply just doesn't work. What I encourage people to do there, one saving grace is to do a very honest postmortem. It's kind of interesting. A lot of the concepts I touch upon, Annie Duke touches upon in her book. She talks about time travel, like mental time travel. Go back in time, go forward in time when you're making these decisions mentally. But after the trade, go back and look at the original trade and do a postmortem. If you were just seeing that trade today, that setup, whatever it may be, would you still have taken that trade? And you have to be really honest with yourself. And that's that's a huge exercise. And I used to find myself thinking quite often, what the hell was I thinking? And now it still happens because I'm not, what's his name? Phil Helmuth. Is that his first name, Phil? Anyway, I'm not Mr. Helmuth and I'm not perfect. Okay. So you got to be really careful being in goal oriented with your outcome biases. And I left this slide in from a few weeks ago because I think it's still sort of relevant. Speaking of Annie Duke. What she recommends doing is coming to peace with a bad outcome in advance. And this is something that I talked about quite a bit in trading full circle before Ms. Duke had her book out. I talked about mind sculpting where you say, okay, I'm going to put this trade on. Let me imagine the market doesn't do anything, go sideways. Let me imagine, assuming it's a long, that the market takes off. I'm going to imagine that I'm taking partial profits. I'm going to imagine that I'm trailing my stop higher. Let's say worst case scenario, the trade begins to implode from the get go and we get stopped out. Well, I'm going to imagine myself taking my lumps and moving on. A, as Mark Douglas once said, a bad salesman makes three or four or five bad phone calls in a row, doesn't get a sale, he goes, drinks his lunch. A good salesman drink makes four or five bad sales calls in a row and says, okay, well, I've got those bad calls out of the way. Let me get a cup of coffee and go make some more calls because I know based on the law of averages, I'm getting close to some sales. Well, same thing works for markets. If you can allow yourself to get stopped out and allow that drawdown to happen, provided, of course, after multiple postmortems that you're picking the best stocks, picking the best and leaving the rest and following the process, then longer term, like a good salesman, you're getting those bad 
trades out of the way. That's why I only buy uh, back when I didn't go. I, I had a brief stint golfing. Every week I got better for about six or eight weeks, and then I started getting worse, and then I quit. <laughs> but, I, uh, but I only buy used clubs, so all the bad shots are already out of them. Coming to peace with a bad outcome in advance will feel better than refusing to acknowledge it, facing it only after it happened. Well, this sort of reaffirms the epiphany I had a while back on why people don't plan their trades. The reason people don't plan their trades is the moment that you plan a trade is the exact moment you have to admit that you can be wrong. We don't like to admit that we can be wrong or will be wrong on occasion. We simply don't like to do it. So if you can mentally rehearse that ahead of time, Ian Robinson, is who I'm trying to think of, does the mind sculpting. He wrote a book on mind sculpting. And you actually sort of make these mental pathways in your mind. When you learn something, there's actually new pathways that are being created. And I'm, I think that's why he calls it mind sculpting. I, I haven't finished this book. It's somewhere around here. I need to finish it. My goal this year is to, is to finish more books than I start, and I'm working pretty hard at that. But anyway, when you, when you learn something new, and I think there's some TED Talks on this out there. I think this one of them talks about your mind is going to be different after you listen to this presentation. Your, your mind is going to be different after you listen to my presentation today because hopefully I've said something that, that you've heard that's new and you formed a new pathway in your mind. And that's what, again, Ian Robinson calls mind sculpting. And the, the, the example he uses is he shows you an ink blot and or a, one of these optical illusion things and you don't see the, the bear or whatever's in it. But then when he shows you it's actually there, your mind makes that connection. And it's actually it could be a, it's actually a physical connection. I'll have to get dig out my neuroscience book to make sure that's correct, but I'm pretty sure it's an actual physical change that occurs in your brain. So anyway, if you train your brain ahead of time and accept that loss, then it makes it a lot easier to actually accept the loss by having that stop getting taken out. By the way, without digressing too far, I know too late. One of the easiest ways to do that, to follow that plan, is let's say the market opens and it's open up here somewhere. And let's say your stop's down here. Well, one of the easiest ways to follow that plan in this particular case would be just place a hard stop, okay, after the open, and then go about your life. Spend some time with loved ones, do some research. Or as one of my clients says, I'm going to go do something that's far more interesting. That's how you know when you made it as a trader, becoming one of those few persistent and consistent, profitable consistent traders is when you – Stop micromanaging, follow the plan, and trading becomes boring. When you find trading becoming boring, you're finally beginning to get it. So if you're interested in uh, her book, just go to Books to Read on my website. And this is something that I've been trying to add to each week. There's so many books that I've read that are worth reading and trading. And a lot of them are outside of trading itself, like the Malcolm Gladwell books. I had not gotten around to putting those up there. But anything new that I read is definitely going to find itself to that page. And if you guys leave some comments on the page, too, let me know if there's something that you think should be included. And if I've read it, I'll put it up there. If I haven't read it, I'll read it and make sure it gets included. All right. So the reason there's not more successful traders is because the real world and the trading world are two different worlds. Wrap your head around that. Accept that. And your life is going to get a lot easier. Trading goes against human nature. Everything I just said, a lot of it, control, outcome biases, it just all goes against human nature. We're simply not made to trade, but that's okay. Recognizing and embracing and accepting these things goes a long ways towards solving the problem. If you identify a problem, that's... That's a, like accepting that you have a problem, okay, that goes a long ways towards actually solving the problems. And a lot of times, like I just said, it does not have to be rocket science, okay? 
again, let's say you're jumping the gun, getting in early, like we talked about somebody was doing earlier, and it's more than one somebody. <laughs> I get about, I always get about 10 emails out of these presentations. Dave, why are you talking about me? I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> because you're one of few, one of many, I should say. It's not just you. But let's say you got a setup and you got an entry right here. You come into the day, market opens somewhere down here, okay? Put in a hard stop to enter that trade. Go about your life, okay? As I just said a second ago, let's say you're long a stock. It did trigger in. You're a good little trend follower. You got your stop in place. And it starts deteriorating a little bit. You find yourself wanting to micromanage. Nope, put in a hard stop. Let the market make the decision for you. Go about your life. Okay, there's a lot of things you can do. I'm not a big fan of limit orders, but let's say you have problems taking partial profits, put in a limit order up here. If that's where your initial partial profit is, go about your life, gets hit, you get paid. Okay. Don't watch that screen. The more observations you make, the more likely you are going to get sucked in to the siren call of micromanagement. Okay, the question is, do you write down three pieces before the trade, entry, objective, and stop? Absolutely. Let's take a look at the aforementioned pie article really quick, okay? So if we go to daylander.com, and I'll move it over once I get this uh, stuff off the screen. I don't know why this, I hate this particular browser. Let me do it over here. Come on. <laughs> I just got back from surfing Costa Rica last night. That message on the surfboard is dead on accurate. Yeah, especially if you're using a styrofoam surfboard. I'm sure you're probably using something a little bit better. All right, so um, Mr. F the article I wrote that I uh, mentioned, Mr. Frey, uh, and I can also, oh, you know what? I've got my spreadsheet in here. I'll show you on the spreadsheet, too, in just one second. But this was the article, and I did a little pun here, trading as easy as pie because the stock was pie, okay? And if you look at this article, you'll see, You have an entry, a protective stop, and then initial profit target. Now, I'll show you the open portfolio in just a second. And I'll walk you through those things. Now, before we get into the charts, any more questions on that? Went to the city bridge looking for leprechauns, pot of gold. Is that where the pot of gold is on the bridge? You walked across the bridge, hooked? That's cool. Yeah, I really wanted to do it. I don't think the weather was that great that day. It was blowing pretty hard. Okay, Donald says he likes his time slot, answering the question from earlier. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll get into We'll answer your question in one second. I, I, don't, I can't say everybody's names anymore because I'm, I screwed up, and I, I, I didn't ask for a first name, so... I'm, Now, as I've been saying for a long time, there's been some imminent top fear mongering, and so far that hasn't happened. You know, I made a little play on words that winter is coming. And I said, well, but not just yet. And now we have a bit of a question mark. And as I said earlier, tops are usually, usually is a key word in that sentence, okay, usually a process. And I think we're having a big process top. Now, if you go back a few weeks, we were looking at the weekly S&P, and this chart isn't updated as of today, but you get the idea. It's only a week or two old. Not much has changed. And we've had a long, long, long time of upside daylight, meaning that the lows of the price are above the moving average. In this case, this is a 50-week moving average, and 
something like bow ties on a weekly basis or the 50 week moving average something even simpler than bow ties can help to keep you on the right side of the market now I left this slide in because of it makes the point you can see we have bull markets lots of green very little or no red bear markets lots of red very little or no green and again red just means the high red means that the high of the price bar is below the moving average and green means the low of the price bar is above the moving average and what's fascinating to me is from 2003 all the way to 2007 there was not any downside daylight it's pretty amazing if you think about it and look at this bear market from 2000 to 2003 there was not any upside daylight and then the great bull run we had in the 90s from the mid 90s on you had tiny tiny bit you have to squint your eyes to see it i don't know if you can see it where you are but i have to really squint even though i'm an inch away from the screen to see it and then guess what look at this bear market that ended in 2009 we had zero upside daylight okay now in the last bull run since 2009 on up it hasn't been a route higher even though the buy and hold people act like it's been this straight up bull market it hasn't there's been a few ugly spots in between and this is especially true on the daily chart but in general there's been a lot of green and not a whole lot of red and now once again we have a lot of green and believe it or not it's still green by the way this does not measure magnitude this is just a count Okay, so these are the number of days of daylight. So you can see we've had about 90 weeks of daylight, believe it or not, on the 50 day, on the 50 period moving average, 50 week moving average in this case. So that's pretty cool. Now, one thing that I've observed is when you get about 100 or so, what happens? Well, not necessarily day after, but, or the week after, but soon you begin to see some corrective action. That might be what we're seeing now. And we'll drill down to uh, the daily charts here in just one second. Now, one of the easiest things you can do, we all need to look at the um, no screens are showing. It should be still working. Oh, man, I hope that didn't... Uh, Well, hopefully, um, it just got stuck. Is that everybody seeing the? Um, did everybody see all that daylight stuff? Don't see a chart. Okay, you see it now. Okay, good. I just changed. Okay. Damn it! That was a good. Uh, well, it'll be in the recording. So, basically, I was just showing the. Uh, the great thing is the recordings are pretty robust. So it might get, like I often say, sometimes a squirrel gets his nuts caught in between the wires between me and you when he's moving his nuts. Uh, but the point I was trying to make is bear market, red, bull market, green, green bull, red bear, green bull, red. Not quite there, but you can see it was a little sketchy for a while. And then back in 2016, if you go back and look at the portfolios from 2015, 2016, we did get quite short, okay? And it wasn't a route higher is what I was also saying. Even though, if you, yes, if you go all the way back to 2009, the market just went up, right, for the most part. But there were some bumps along the way. Varmints, yeah. Anyway, the thing we all, you should look at the charts. You should look at the longer-term charts. Look at the weekly charts. And see where we are. So far, we're still in a longer term bull market based on something like as simple as daylight, as simple as the 50 day moving average. And we'll look at the live charts here in one second and flesh that out some more. But one thing that you can do, because again, it might be a process, it might take a while for that top to form. But one thing you do, and I highly recommend, is let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. Let stops take you out of existing longs, as it has recently. And it's only left us with one leftover long, this LX trade in here. 
and listen to the database. And the database has put us in a couple of shorts, okay? Now, the database has, since these were put on, has also generated some more shorts. But the reason that we didn't take them was, well, the shorts we're in really weren't working that great. And for us to take on more positions, when we have a couple of positions that aren't working very well, we like to let the portfolio prove itself before adding more on. And also, when you start hitting those initial profit targets, you free up more cash and then you have more capital to put to work. But the bottom line is you let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. Let the stops take you out. Let triggers bring pull you into new entries and new positions and then take those partial profits and that frees up capital. And then just listen to your database. If you're seeing a plethora of shorts and you can't find a long to set your, save your life, then maybe you should be thinking about buying the market as opposed to shorting. If you're seeing a plethora of shorts, as we saw recently, and not a whole lot of longs, maybe you should think about putting on a few shorts. Okay. Yeah, good good points. We'll get to that when we get to the, uh, the live In fact, we'll jump into the live charts now. Okay. So as I was showing, and I don't know what actually got seen on your end for the people in the live presentation, people at home uh, watching later or at work watching later. I want to show you the concept of daylight, or as I call it, now call it Dave Light. Let's see if we can add this. Oops. Let's add a... Oops, why does it do that? I have a, a window hidden somewhere. Let's do this. Let's add a moving average. Where's the window popping up? Oh, it keeps doing that. Oh, here we go. There it is. Got a lot of windows open. Stuff's getting hidden. So we put in a 50... 50-day moving average, okay, or let's just call it 50-period moving average to keep the confusion from setting in. We could see, we can go all the way back to 2016 and see that we've had daylight through this entire period. We almost kissed it right here. We almost kissed it right here. As soon as the prices kiss it, what's going to happen is this, this implode count is going to go to zero. Okay, so we'll have zero daylight. And as I said earlier, I don't know if you saw it or not, but when it gets up to around 100, 100 weeks, the market tends to correct. Now, I'm not a reversion to the mean player, and I don't play overbought, oversold, but the point I was trying to make is that when you do get these extreme readings, the market tends to correct. Now, keep in mind, again, this is not measuring the magnitude. It's measuring the number of days. So as soon as this moving average tags that move that as soon as the price tags the moving average, this is going to implode like it did here, as you can see, okay, and then here, okay, and so on and so forth. And same thing to the upside. As soon as it tags it to the upside, notice we had that one little bar in 2002 where it tagged the moving average. Didn't get above the moving average. The low didn't get above the moving average, but it tagged it. So we went from all of this downside daylight back to zero, and then the count started over. Now, somebody asked last week, and week, week before actually, do you take a cumulative count? Like, would you add this on to this? And the reason I said no was because then it starts getting complicated, okay? So I think this simple indicator is probably the best way to go. So you can see the upside daylight, the downside daylight, and then also see, again, the number of days of daylight to know whether or not we're getting close or closer to a correction. All right, so anyway, we still have upside daylight in the S&P 500. Now let's drill down to the daily, keep the questions coming. And by the way, if you want to start asking about stock picks, please do so now. On a daily basis, notice we have crossed back below the 50-day moving average, not the end of the world, okay? Nothing magical about the 50-day moving average. I don't know if Phil's here or not. He might argue with me. 
but it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. And even on a daily chart, you can see we've had mostly upside daylight for a long, long time. Just one or two days of downside daylight going back to the middle of 2017 or the end of 2017, I should say. And then again, a lot, a lot, a lot of upside daylight until what happened. We just had this little correction recently. Now, the thing that concerns me with the S&P 500, and I'll show you a few representative sectors in one second here, is that so far we just had this retrace rally higher, and it might be a little bit more obvious, as I think I was talking with my people in the service last night. If you take a look at, a let's say, a three-day chart or a four-day chart, it's a little bit more obvious that the market, which was trending nicely higher, Corrected and now so far it's just retracing its leg down. Somebody asked me, I wrote an article for, for Proactive Advisor Magazine. If you go in and watch last week's in chart, Lick Weekly Charts, and the one I did prior to that, which I think was a month prior to that, they asked me, um, is the the recent, let's say the first thrust signal we talked about, was that signal a whipsaw? And my answer was, well, yeah, technically a whipsaw, but it did, the market did have a pretty serious sell off out of that pattern before it went back up. So if you were trading it, you could have taken partial profits. And then the second part of that, my answer was that, yes, it was a whipsaw possibly, if you wanna look at it like, oh, it triggered and now it's back above where it triggered. But the point I was making is that that signal remains in place, that so-called top, if you wanna call it that, remains in place until and unless the market goes on to make new highs, okay? So in the case of the NASDAQ, if we were looking at that signal back here, and I think that was his question, the NASDAQ. So we had the thrust down, we had a little bit of a retrace or a pullback, and then we had the thrust down. So this would have been your sell. It was a pretty serious sell-off. So that top remains in place until and unless we take out that top, which we did recently. Now, looking at the NASDAQ, the problem that I see here is that we have this V-shaped recovery at a high level. By the way, most of the times, you know, one problem with these books on classical technical analysis is they show a double top and say, well, that's a double top. It's like, okay. Well, double tops usually don't look like that. They look like this. It overshoots the prior top, okay? Or even worse, it undershoots the prior top. It looks a little bit more like that. So rarely does everything happen in a textbook manner. Do read those books on technical analysis on my recommended reading page, but just take them with a grain of salt and realize that things don't always shake out exactly. So this could still be a double top. The way I look at it is that we overshot the prior top, but that's okay. Sometimes it works out like that. But my problem with these V-shaped recoveries, as I preach ad nauseum, is by the time the market's all the way back to its old highs, it's already overbought. And it's hard to launch a new leg on top of an old one like that without some corrective action. And if you have corrective action, as we're seeing now, from this level, a little outside day down a couple days ago. See that right there? I think that's, a, uh, in candle terms, what's that? A um, fat man just ate a little baby. I think that's what they call it or something like that. Um, now, I wouldn't rush out and sell a market and put a position on because it has an outside day down, but you certainly want to pay attention when that occurs. Fat man abandoned a baby on the side of the road. I forget what they call it. Something like that. Anyway, so NASDAQ pulling back below its prior low peak in here. Longer term, um, it looks a little bit better so far, just kind of a pullback or if you want to call it a TKO type of move, sort of a TKO type of move in a weekly chart. Draw your big blue arrow. Everything looks pretty kosher when you look at that longer term bull leg in the NASDAQ. Now, technology like the NASDAQ is looking pretty good in here or better than a lot of other sectors. The same problem exists there too, though. Let's let's look at the semis. Here's the semiconductors. Same problem here is that they're already overbought. So if they begin to correct too much, they'll come back in. Possible double tops in the work or other types of tops could happen. 
Some areas did break free like software, so that looks pretty good. As long as we don't come back in pr below the prior breakout levels, that'd be great. Hardware, or as I think most people call it, Apple. It's pretty much just Apple. But there are some subsectors within that you can look at within hardware. But also it's broken out. Now, my big concern is when you look at some of these brick and mortar places, and I just randomly pick manufacturing, but also material and construction, same sort of action there, which is literally brick and mortar. Uh, old school companies like insurance, okay, banks, they all, like the S&P 500, have this retrace look to them, or most all, meaning they're stolen out after not quite making it back to their old highs. And what else is doing that? Transports, a little bit more impressive retrace, but still stalling short of their old highs and not quite getting there. So that's a little bit concerning that that's happening. And even some areas that you might consider technology, such as drugs, also have a bit of that retrace look to them. Now, get back, getting back to the NASDAQ again. NASDAQ usually represents technology. Okay, a lot of technology stocks in the NASDAQ. So as goes the NASDAQ, as goes technology. And then as goes the S&P, usually as goes financials and things like that on things of that nature. So we need to pay attention to what's going on in the market. We need to pay attention to what's going on in these sectors. And then let the database through your individual setups tell you where you should be trading. A couple more things just real quick. Take a look at like metals and mining. Also sort of did a little bit of a retrace and now they're dying back out. And also other commodities such as the energies, if I could find them, there they are, have didn't do quite as well in their retrace rally. Just kind of pulled back a little bit and based on today's action, just not looking too good at all. So there's a lot of problems with the market. But as usual, and as I preach, take things one day at a time. A few days ago, with the NASDAQ at brand new highs and a lot of these technology areas at brand new highs, it looked pretty good. But that's why you got to be patient. You can't just flip a switch and say, oh, I'm a bull now, no longer bear. You just have to take each little piece of the puzzle and make your plan. Things got to run. Nice to hear your down to earth thoughts and reflections. Oh, thank you. Can we look at BA, please? Yeah, we'll start looking at some of these things. Donald says bearish and golfing. Okay, I thought it was a sumo wrestler eating a little baby or something like that. Sitting on a baby, maybe. All right, Kenneth wants to talk about ES, which I can't pull up on this particular screen, but I assume you're talking about the E mini. So let's take a look at the uh, SP 500. And uh, let me see if we can get out of this uh, chart thing. Let's just take a look at spiders for now. Let's see. Okay. Now. Quick speech on efficiency. My goal is to find a little IPO. I'll just give you an example like LX, okay, which is inefficient. It went from, where is this to there? It rallied 40% in a couple of days, okay? So my goal is to find something where everything isn't priced in. The S&P 500, you have fund managers, you have a bunch of little one ladders out there and e-minis you have indexers you have hedgers you have a lot of people fighting it out it creates in general a choppy market it's not an inefficient market it becomes choppy because so many people are fighting it out so i would urge you to instead of trading e-minis i would urge you to trade individual stocks and learn how to Pick stocks. If you are going to trade something like e minis or Forex, I like to trade Forex, don't get me wrong. Find a point and pattern where they can make inefficient moves. So, for instance, in the SP 500, from here to here is a very inefficient move, okay? That obviously wasn't priced in. So, if we take a look at something like bow ties and we take a look at something like an hourly chart, and hopefully my chart will go far enough back. To show you, you could see that on an hourly basis, we back the chart out a little bit. Notice that the S&P 500 made all-time highs and on an hourly basis made a bow tie, okay? 
And if your time frame is a little shorter, let's say you're trading five minute charts, we'll trade five minute bow ties off of all time highs or off of multi month highs or something to get a little scalp out of it. But you can see nice little trigger in here. And this whole little slide we saw recently all came from a bow tie off of major, major highs. So find a spot, pick a spot to trade it where it has the potential to make an inefficient type of move. Now, if we're looking, if you look at a trade on a daily basis, well, it's just chopping all around. There's really nothing that I see needs to be done unless you say, well, maybe bigger picture wise. It looks like it's in trouble and it shouldn't go above 280, so I'm going to short it. But I don't have an actual setup here unless you went back in time. Obviously, we had a setup on this first thrust down, which I think was also a bow tie. So I don't know if that helps. Is there if that's more you want me to ask about it or when we flesh it out a little bit more? I'd be happy to. We'll look at bowling for Al. Boeing. BA. I'm not going to be a huge fan of something like Boeing because it's a big, thick, efficient stock. Notice the volume here, 4 million, 46 million. You, gotta, you have to add two zeros to this. So it's 46 million. Is that correct? Is that right? I think the new TC doesn't have that. You have, it already does it for you. But it's a lot of volume. So let's put a bow tie. Let's put the bow tie moving averages in it. So as I said earlier, Tops are more of a process. We might have a bit of a process top working here. I would not buy Boeing. But now, wait a minute. I just said, hey, uh, let's trade more inefficient issues. But when it comes to shorting, it's a little bit of just the opposite. I like to short more efficient issues. We're short Pulte right now, which is a home builder. And these brick and mortar type stocks, no pun intended, tend to tend to trade in line with, and I hate to say it, but fundamentals, okay? I just said the F word. But they're, by trading in line with fundamentals, I mean they're priced often for perfection. When you find something coming off of high levels, they tend to be priced for perfection. And I think Boeing would qualify because it's a big, thick stock, well-analyzed, lots of people in here fighting it out. And if this thing begins to crack, it's going to crack and hard. So I would watch for that bow tie, especially since it's coming off of major highs. Remember, we're looking for an inefficient move in an efficient market. In this particular case, Boeing is going to be fairly efficient based on the fact that it has a tremendous amount of volume. Okay. So if anything, I would look to short it. Bearish gatekeeper pattern in the play in the S&P 500 daily, possibly. Uh, a gatekeeper is the closest thing to reversal that I'll trade. So if we take a look at the S&P 500. And let's clean up the chart. A gatekeeper is when a market sells off hard and comes back sharply and stalls short of the prior highs. Now, I did use the, the F word, the other F word, Fibonacci. I'm not a huge fan of Fibonacci, and I tend to eyeball it. I rarely draw the retracements, but if you were to use a Fibonacci, it's like something around 786. Between 618 and 786, stalling out somewhere in an area after a thrust down. My problem with the Fibonacci people is that their charts look like this, you know, and then they draw one right here, and then they draw one right here and then they draw one right here and then before long you have you have all these lines on the chart so no matter what happens the market always reverses at one of the lines and it's not always the case and that's why i pick on the candle people too because it's always a pattern and it's not always a pattern but it would have you'd have to be looking at like a four-day chart if you wanted to make the case that it was a gatekeeper meaning I hit the thrust down and then the thrust back up and then stalling short of those prior highs, okay? There are a few rare cases where I could actually say something Fibonacci-ish does work. And if you're going to do Fibonacci, pick a major, major high to the recent low, okay, or su something such as um, IPOs, 
for instance, okay, where you have a major low defined and let's say it takes off. See, notice that you've got a deep retrace in here. That I'll, that I'll allow, okay, one set of lines, but don't draw 50 different lines on your chart. Now, I know that some people, if they make actually make the living doing that, that's fine. Um, just be careful that you don't always make a prediction off of that. Have a good reason, right? MDGL is a short. MDGL. Yeah, this stock looks like it's in trouble. It did have a big gap up here. Now, one concern is if you get a short, uh, this is an inefficient stock. It's kind of thin, okay, to be shorting. It's got a high HV, this big gap here. The problem with shorting something like this is, let's say you do get short, but then they announce a clinical trial or something, and the stock goes up 50% overnight. So you could be a hurt and pop. But, yeah, long or short, a uh, good eye. Notice that we're getting ready to have a bow tie to the downside. So if this thing slides a little more on a bounce, it would be a worthy short. But, again, you've got the big gap back here. But that would be an okay problem to have if it sold off down to the gap. I would personally pass just because I don't think it's worth the risk to short a technology stock, at least at this juncture, okay? Maybe if we get into a little bit of longer-term bull market or bear market, I should say, then uh, we'll be um, shorting some more. Okay, the charts have gone away again. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay. Let me unshow or show my screen again and see if they fix that. All right. Hopefully you see that now. Okay. So, yeah, we just said MDGL, possible bow tie down, but everything I just said. Monthly SPX may be an extreme above 200A. Okay, let's take a look at that. So if we take a look at the SP500, and then we put in a 200 period move it average, okay? And let's double check that. Let's clean that up. Okay, let's see. Okay, so this is the daily chart. This is a 200 moving average. Kind of cool we came down here, corrected right to it. I'm sure somebody put that in their blog, like, you see, you just buy it when it hits a 200. Well, yeah, that'll work until it don't, okay? It didn't work that back here. It didn't work, you know, in here. But, yeah, it's worked quite well over the past three years, two and a half years at least. So he's saying on a monthly chart, let's look at a monthly chart. That's crazy. Let's see. Got a monthly, and he's saying it's getting a little extended. Yeah, and this is a logarithmic chart too, so it's probably even be worse on an arithmetic, or is it arithmetic? I heard somebody call it arithmetic the other day. Which one is correct? I've always called it arithmetic, but I might be wrong. Yeah, it's stretched, it's stretched a long ways away, and you've had a lot of... Uh, monthly daylight for a long time but look at the monthly daylight you had going all the way back to when was that jeez you see this is why you can't wait for like a, yeah 19 back to the 70s right this is why you can't wait for sometimes a monthly to turn or a weekly to turn even though i do talk about monthly charts sometimes and weekly charts quite often you have to pay attention to what's going on daily but yeah it's stretched if you're looking back that far can't argue with that Charts not changing. That stinks. Let me see what the audience view is. Hang on. Yeah, it must be a bug. Well, that just stinks. Well, that doesn't do you any good, does it? I wonder why it's doing that. Well, that makes me mad. I spent a lot of money on this software. Show my screen. Screen two, clean. Almost like a climax for so far above. Yeah, but, you know, it's, what do you got to do? You know, markets can stay irrational a lot more than you can stay solvent. Lag in the video stream. Sorry about that. Well, that stinks. I see winter is coming. Still seeing that? Okay. All right, I guess I'll complain.
Okay. What happened to Cree today? Let's take a look at that. Nothing. <laughs> it just uh, it just shot higher and came back in. I wouldn't get excited about that, but there's no tradable pattern there. Okay. Wrong slide. Black having me too. Excellent come back. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. My apologies. I'll have to um, complain. Okay, let's try to look at one more stock, and then um, I could just walk you through it if not. CASA. Yeah, CASA looks great, but it's not set up yet. So let me just kind of mentally tell you what's going on here. Started around 18 in this last run and shot higher to 32. It looks fantastic, accelerating higher, but you want to wait for a pullback. Well, we're kind of we're kind of running out of time anyway here, so let's go ahead and wrap it up since we're having some technical difficulties. My apologies on that. Uh, hopefully, and that's a word you should never use in trading, but hopefully, as regards to the go to webinar, the local recording has worked uh, very well in the past, at least. So hopefully, it uh, we captured all these charts because boy, I'd hate to lose this show uh, if I say so myself. But anyway, if we don't talk again, I look forward to seeing you guys and girls in the next show. I don't have uh, a hard time and date for that. If you're watching this, this recording and you want to suggest a time and date, let me know and I'll see if I can accommodate. Uh, my schedule is kind of up in the air. Lately, I've been working on two offices, as I've been saying in the now account. But anyway, if we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again for showing up today. I appreciate it. Uh, as you can tell, this is the highlight of my week. So thank you so much. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk again and then I'll see you in the next show. Thank you so much.